Assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. First and foremost, our condolences on behalf of Imam Hussein TV to everyone who has parted away, those families who have lost loved ones, unfortunately, in this stricken era, as it were, that is continuing to prevail. Our, po our topic tonight, quarantine and Quran time, as it were. As you all know, the corona quarantine isolation has affected everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims. But how do Muslims reset themselves? Spiritually, one of the ways to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through, of course, the Holy Quran in quarantine. But how close are we to the Holy Quran? Have we neglected our relationship here? Do we need to rebuild this relationship? What are we doing about it? How are we self-evaluating? How are we actually looking to seek to improve ourselves and maintain our faith, as it were? Tonight, we wish to explore and take a different stream and add some excitement, as it were, a different dimension to the, tonight's program through evaluating the Qur'an through the letters from A to Z, using all the key words, as it were, from A to Z, as it were. With that in mind, inshallah, I'd like to introduce you once again to our distinguished guest, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Wa alaikum as wa A privilege once again to have you on this Thank show. Thank you, good to have you back as well. Um, condolences. Been, well. Condolences, as I said, you know, to Muslims and non-Muslims, actually, who have been, you know, affected by this virus. And unfortunately, it has taken its toll. And we must be obviously weary and respectful of their time as well. With that in mind, Sayyidina, where are we actually in our relationship with the Holy Quran? And what should we, what should our boundaries be today? If there are any. Well, I think, alhamdulillah, this is one of uh, the positive points and the blessings that a person is able to take from this difficult time. Uh, that you would have noticed last week in our series on the Imam that so many Beautiful people series. feel a reconnection alhamdulillah. with the Imam of our time. And so many people are furthering their knowledge, their reading, their analysis yeah. of the Thaqalain of the Ahlul Bayt and likewise of the Holy Quran. And there is a need for us to reconnect with the Holy Quran. And even those who are connected with the Holy Quran, there is no limit to how much you can explore the Holy Quran. Naturally. Because if you were to put two poles for a person to look at, one pole, I would look at the verse about the donkey that carries luggage and the other poll I would put on the Day of Judgment as to what the Qur'an says. So, on the one side we have the famous verse in the Holy Qur'an, which talks about those nations who had the revealed book which they neglected. neglected yes. Which they didn't explore, which they didn't realize the benefit of in their lives. In Surah Al-Jum'ah, mm -hmm. you'll find that Muslims every Friday will hear this verse. But hearing and taking heed of the verse is two completely different things. Absolutely, de totally different. There may be someone who hears this verse on a weekly basis. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of those who had the Torah. The nations before us, the children of Israel, were given the Torah. True. And in being given the Torah, you found that some members of the children of Israel kept the Torah, protected the Torah, wouldn't disrespect the Torah no. in the sense of leaving it laying on the ground. It would always be looked after. But they were carrying it and the similitude is given of the donkey that carries luggage. Okay. Or the donkey that carries a book with it. If you, for example, in those days imagine... 
that a book wholesaler has asked somebody to be their courier to deliver a set of books from one place to another. Mm -hmm. A set of holy scriptures from one place to another. And the donkey that carries these will carry them all the way. Yeah. But will not reflect, will not ponder, right. will not examine uh -huh. as to what exactly they are carrying. Yeah, They're sure. carrying it. Yes. The book is in their position. Absolutely. But then donkey just simply carries the book yes. until it reaches its destination. Sure, sure. We may also be of those who may carry the Qur'an until mm -hmm. we reach the grave without having ever... Explored it. Explored the Qur'an. Yes, yep. And there is no limit to the amount of exploration mm. that can be done. This example of the donkey is a striking example. And it's one end of our... Spectrum. Spectrum tonight. Yeah. Where we don't want to be those who have this Qur'an at home and may carry it with respect, but without bothering to ponder and reflect. Mm. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum, which is the Qur'an complaining about being abandoned on the Day of Judgment. Right, right. So you've got the Holy Prophet saying that my nation has abandoned this holy book. I told them that I'm leaving it behind with them, not just for them to bring it out in weddings and funerals. There are many who may bring the Qur'an out in a wedding. Yes. Or in a funeral. But the rest of the year, there is no relationship with the Holy Qur'an. Sure. We do have some who have bothered to memorize. Alhamdulillah. We have others who are wonderful qaris yes, of the Holy Qur'an. Yes, beautiful recitals. You love listening to their recital. Sure. In Egypt, you have wonderful recitals. In Iran, you have wonderful mm, recitals. Mm. But there is the striking verse in the Holy Quran where the Holy Prophet says that my nation has Nicholas. abandoned this yeah. book. And we don't want to be of those. So therefore, in this period of quarantine, take from quarantine the word Quran. Sure, alhamdulillah. And try and somehow build that relationship. Because building that relationship stands us in good stead. Yes. At the end of the day, spiritually, there is a connection with the divine breath. Yes, alhamdulillah. What is the Qur'an? But the divine words, words of, Allah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah. between those two covers. Sure. Yes. I continuously build my relationship with my Lord. And in this period where I may not have many friends and I may be in isolation, let me make the Qur'an my friend. Mm. In this difficult period yes. where you don't have many around you, build your relationship with the holy book. Let that holy book become your friend. Because when that holy book becomes your friend, your life changes completely. Right. There are ordinances in that holy book which are striking. There are verses in that holy book when you open it and you have a conviction that Allah is going to speak to you, a verse will come in front of you there and then. And I'm sure this happened to you. Yes, yes. Alhamdulillah. Where you've had moments where you've just wanted... A message from the Holy Quran. Yeah, some sort of guidance. Some Absolutely. sort of guidance. And yes. not just leave that for the world of istikhara. No, no, no. Some no. people leave it for the world of istikhara. Not just the world of istikhara. Sure. Every day. Every day. Yes. As Muhsin Fayyad Kashani mm -hmm. in Zad al Salik, he would, he would teach us that of the spiritual stations or the stations that you pass in your journey. One of them should be to recite 50 verses of the Holy Qur'an a day. A day, No yes. more. If you could do more, do. Alhamdulillah. But 50. And then hopefully you will not be of those who the Prophet complains about sure. or who the Qur'an complains, complains about, about on the Day of Judgment. SubhanAllah, thank you for that. Academically, academically, how much interest is there in the Holy Qur'an? Specifically in non-Muslim circles. Muslim and non-Muslim circles in particular. Because this is really important in, in terms of Myself and yourself, we've come here on air many times now, alhamdulillah. And we're really looking to promote the message of the Holy Ahlul Bayt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Quran. Not just really to carry about uh, uh, weariness or awareness, as it were, for Muslims, but non-Muslims as well. What would you say about that? Well, there's uh, been a great interest in the Quran... I would say 
in non-Muslim academic circles since the 1970s. Okay, right. Albeit, I would argue that in the 1970s there was a real skepticism mm -hmm. and a downplaying of the role of the Qur'an. There was a revisionist school represented by the likes of John Wansborough, Patricia Croner, who had, in a way, attacked the Qur'an through the attack on the position of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. So these were academics. They were a school of academics at SOAS University. And their method of downplaying the Qur'an was to highlight that, look, there is a lot of inconsistency about the way Muslims depict Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. There's a lot of inconsistency about the position of Mecca mm -hmm. in early um, in Arabian society. And they downplay, therefore, the role of the Quran through an attack on the Prophet and on Mecca. To the extent that they say that this text in reality is not a text dated back to, you know, the Prophet Muhammad's time and right. so on. Rather, this is possibly a text that one can date to much later. Okay. So that particular school was a school that academically looked down at the Qur'an. Uh, there was definitely no belief in this being uh, a word of God, let alone one of the holy scriptures. That yes, there may have been more of a case for Judaism and Christianity uh, than there was for the Qur'an. Yes. However, on the first level, there were academics who did reply back to that revisionist school mm -hmm. in looking at early Islamic literature. So there was a back and forth. I would say as well the likes of, you know, a particular article in 1999, Toby Lester's article, What is the Qur'an? Um, I think that is an important article that signaled possibly a change. Right in interaction with the Holy Qur'an that could be seen becoming more striking after September the 11th. So after September the 11th, now it wasn't just in academic circles. There were non-Muslims outside of academic circles who were now asking about the Qur'an. Yes, yes. Course. And I'm sure you remember there was, I think, an increase in the sales of the Qur'an Absolutely. after That's September right. the 11th. There was, you know, a lot of people were more interested in, what is this book? You yeah, know, sure. what, does this book lead to violence? Yeah, is this book yeah. a book which has brought about, you know, hatred and mm -hmm. anger? Mm -hmm. um, how does this terrorism occur? Exactly. What is the verse that's the basis of this? Sure. So I would say that since September the 11th, in the academy, as well as outside of the academy, uh -huh. there's been a lot more interest in the origin of the Qur'an, right. the message of the Qur'an, and the sciences of the Qur'an. Okay, okay. So the actual text of the Qur'an and the relationship mm -hmm. with the context right, right. in which these verses were being revealed. I see, I see. So you have this interest had increased... And not just an increase in interest with non-Muslim academics, but also Muslim academics were willing to theologically re-examine the Qur'an and its context Difficult. and its revelation. Right, right. So the likes of Fazl al-Rahman mm -hmm. or Nasr Abu Zaid or yes. people like this, they were ready to re-examine the historicity of the Qur'an, the context of the revelation of the Qur'an, the eternal message of the Qur'an versus the message that was relative to the community at that time. What was the position of the Qur'anic message in Mecca versus the Qur'anic message in Medina? Are all Qur'anic laws applicable in every context or was it just for that context? Right. So there definitely has been a resurgence in a willingness to discuss the Qur'an and actually have a discourse centered on the Qur'an, mm -hmm. rather than the Qur'an being a means to a discourse on whether Islam is the religion of God, I or see. whether the Prophet Muhammad was a false prophet. Sure. Do you see sure. what I'm saying? Yes. Now there's actually a willingness and a fervor to discuss the discover. actual content yep. and context of the Holy Qur'an. Right. So it's not just non-Muslim academics who were having a back and forth, the likes of Wandsborough or Kroner or Sargent or you know others in the field, Ripon, who were looking at the Qur'an and trying to see you know, 
whether this book was a book can, that can be relied upon as being revealed in that particular context in relation to Mecca and the Prophet. Now we were actually looking at the content of the Quran. Mm. Now we're looking at its verses, its chapters, yes. its development. Sure. So I think there's been a great resurgence. And I think Quranic studies in the, in the academic world will only go from strength to strength. There was a period where, as Fred Donner talks of, the fact that you know, Quranic studies was in disarray. You, know, you may have had very strong um, you know, uh, scholars of uh, philosophy or strong scholars of law or theology, but Quranic studies, mm -hmm. there seem to be maybe a negligence, maybe disarray, maybe a back and forth between Orientalists yes, and those yes. who are traditional or holding on to a particular tradition. Right. But now I'm, I think you're seeing more of a willingness to look at the Quran. Mm -hmm. And the context of it. Okay, thank you for that. As viewers, I did mention in the beginning of this show, we're looking to explore this show, this particular show, in a different way. Hopefully, let's make it entertaining. And as I said, you know, that we're looking at the letters A to Z. You've seen naturally on TV game shows, people play Scrabble. So, with that in mind, let's start with the letter A. Sayyidina, A for Arabic. Why is the Arabic language and how important is it to learn for our communities, as it were? Why was the Quran revealed in the Arabic language, mm. you know, is, is a question that people ask until today. Right. And it's interesting that you've picked, you know, A for Arabic. You could have had so many other options. But yes. yeah, the Arabic language, first and foremost, we don't believe that the Quran is the only book that was given to mankind, mankind. by the Lord. No, no. And th every single nation, as the Quran says in Surah 14, verse number 4, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ We have not sent a messenger except with the language of, of their, their people. Mm, their community, yes. Their community. Therefore, if we believe that prophets were sent to every nation, yes, there may be 25 who are mentioned in the Quran. Mm -hmm. But how many prophets do we have? 124,000 people talk yes. of in narrations and so on. That means there were prophets who spoke Indian, those who spoke Chinese, sure. yes. those who spoke Aramaic, right. those who spoke Hebrew, uh -huh. those who spoke Arabic. So therefore, if someone says, why would God reveal a text in the Arabic language is God therefore saying that I've got to learn Arabic for me to understand what is the correct path of guidance to follow? No. no. The Lord was not just choosing the Arabs. Before the Arabs, you had Aramaic. Right. Before the Arabs, you had, for example, other languages in which the Lord spoke to the people through the prophets who he had mm -hmm. sent to them. So therefore, on the first level, let's not just imagine that the Arabs and Arabic... Right. Are the chosen languages of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. And nor the chosen people. And nor the chosen people. Yeah. But it so happened that the last message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went to an Arabian prophet amongst the Arabs. Right. Okay. Inna anzalnahu Quran Arabian. Yeah. We've sent down this Arabic Quran. So that you people may be able to comprehend. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family was raised amongst the Arabs. Arabs. Now, if he speaks Chinese to them, there's a problem. Yes. He speaks Urdu to them or yes. Farsi to them, there's an issue. Yes. You're obviously going to speak the language which the people can relate, relate to, to. Which, by the way, baffles me when we have Majalis in certain languages, in certain cities, which the youth cannot relate to. Yes, yeah. Ajeeb. People say, why our youth don't come to the mosque? Which city are you in? Says London. <laughs> Says now the main language of the speaker of the mosque or the imam of your mosque is what? It's Arabic. So how's the youth going to come? Well, the imam's going to try and speak some English. Well, if the imam's not going to speak English fluently, that youth is on WhatsApp or on any other app very shortly. There was a lesson that when the Holy Prophet emerged, mm. he is the one who sent a prophet from amongst yeah. them. Yeah. Yes. Therefore, on the first level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not racist. No. 
the prophets were sent with the lisan, with the, the tongue, tongue, with the language the of their communities. communities. The Holy Prophet, therefore, being amongst the Arabs, Arabs. is not like Moses and Jesus, for example, being amongst their people. Yes, yes. Of course, the community that the Holy Prophet goes to may have different dialects. There are discussions about the difference in the dialects between those of North Arabia North, and South, South Arabia. Naturally, naturally. Naturally. Yes. There are certain people in that community who are the best of poets that you'll find. Right. There's a particular type of poetry that they understand. Sure. There's a particular structure to the Arabic language that they understand, particular rules that they understand. Hence, many times in the Quran, the reply back to him when he recites a verse of the Holy Quran, these are the words of a magician or these are the words of a poet. poet. Yes. If it's the words of a magician, they're admitting that the Arabic that he has <laughs> is a bit higher, higher than theirs. Superior, yes. Because magic is something extraordinary, not ordinary. No, that's right, yes. Or they would call him Sha'ar, poet. poet. They know their poetry. Right. So they know that what's coming from him is different. It's different, unique. Walid ibn al-Mughira, his Arabic was above everybody else there. Mm. Yes, quite right. And yet Walid ibn al-Mughira could not take it. When he heard the verses of the Holy Quran, could not take it. How is it that he is able to speak in this way? Now, he recognized that there wasn't no real formal education of a, let's say, a, a Harvard or a Princeton or a Cambridge or Oxford in Mecca at that time. Sure. There were certain people proficient in the Arabic language. Yes, certain yes, people, certain brilliant people. poets. Yes, very bright, intelligent people. People who are writing contracts as well sure. in terms of trade. Yes. Because, you know, rock graffiti is right. able to show us inscriptions that there were people in Arabia who were able to read and write. Right. Maybe more than we assume. Because okay. the numbers that were normally given where there's only 15, 16, 17, there's a possibility that there were more yeah. than that. But what you have is that Walid al Mughira cannot believe what's coming from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. And of course, the Quran is not the words of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. It's the words of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta right. Misconception. Because yes. when we do A to Z of the Quran, this A to Z is useful for non Muslims as well as Muslims. Yes. Because you're right in choosing A for Arabic. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an Arabic book, but they were Aramaic. Yes. There were books revealed to people in other, in other languages. Languages. He emerges amongst the Arabs, but they notice something different, different. about what's being offered to them. Yes. Some of them call him Sha'ar, some say, In hadha la sihrun uh -huh. So that would be the second reason, quite logical, that if you're emerging amongst the Arabs, mm -hmm. then if you reveal to them in something a different language, they're going to be thinking what's going on. Of course. Yes. Yes, before in Aramaic, there was a community that was chosen by God, right. but sadly neglected the bounties, bounties which God kept on giving them by killing prophets of God who kept yeah. coming to them. Yes, yes. I think on the third level, the grammar of Arabic. Okay. Um, it's a rich, it's rich, quite unique. rich, unique. Believe you me, when, 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 you're, when you're looking in, in the Arabic of the Quran uh -huh. and you see simple English translation. Qist, Adla. Adala, Qist. Both of them are translated when you see English translations. Justice. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Justice. justice. But there is a difference between qist and ad. In English, one word, justice. Justice, yes. Some might add another word, some might say equity and so yeah, on. But sure, majority sure. of the time you will see the translation, justice. justice. One qist is referring to a distribution of shares. The other may be referring to giving a judgment, judgment. with justice. Yeah. Akma. A'ma. Right. If I was to say to you, someone's blind in English, blind in terms of their heart, blind in the terms of their eyes, it's the same word, same blind. Word. Absolutely, yes. In Arabic, the one who is physically blind only, right. Akma. I see. The one who is physically blind mm -hmm. and lacks insight, right. Blind in the heart? Sure, sure. Akma, physically blind. A'ma, blind physically and in the mm. heart. Precise. The precision, the word 
formation, the grammar, the rules are intricate. If, okay. if, okay. in English, simple if. Yes. Arabic, law, in, either, <laughs> each one of them. It's slightly different. Slightly different. And we could go on of with course, the yes. of Arabic, but we want to get through absolutely, another 25 absolutely. letters, inshallah. Thank yeah. you, subhanAllah. Thank you so much for that uh, deep insight, as it were. Just on a letter A. Now, moving on to B. B for Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The magnificent introduction, as it were, to every surah of the Holy Quran. Except for Surah Tawbah. 113 mm. times God begins. The chapters of the Holy Quran yeah. in the name of God, the God, most beneficent, the most merciful, merciful. Yeah. the most kind, the most merciful. And even that, if I may add, is slightly low and diluted. <laughs> even that translation is not going to help. Yeah. What's the difference between Rahman and Rahim? Sure. <laughs> and English, you might say beneficent. So we could go on about translations Absolutely. nonstop. But Bismillah Rahman Rahim, God begins every surah of the Holy Quran. Yeah. 114 surahs. Sure. God begins every single one with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim ar in the name of God. And there is the central understanding of mercy. Mm. Our existence is due to mercy. Divine Everything mercy, is mercy. Yes. Divine mercy. Rahman, mercy to all his all creation. Rahim, to particular, particular believers. Yes, yes. Except one chapter of the Holy Quran that does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Which chapter? Surah Tawbah. Surah the Tawbah. Surah 9 of the Holy Quran mm. is the only chapter that does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahim. And rather begins with Bara'a, a Bara particular dissociation yeah. from the Meccans who had continuously broken the treaties which the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family had made with them. However, it's mentioned 114th time. Yes. Where in the letter, letter of Hazrat Suleiman. Suleiman's letter sent to the queen of Sheba. Sheba. And he highlights to all of us whenever you begin any amal, begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So therefore, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim was not only in the Holy Quran, but previously. Previous. Ahsan. Okay, subhanAllah. C now for compilation. And we can have many words for each letter, but just taking one in short compilation. Compilation of the Holy Quran is one that scholars continue to debate and disagree over. Mm -hmm. And even within the Shi'i school, there are disagreements. Within the other schools in Islam, there are disagreements about the compilation of the Holy Quran. Right. Amongst the opinions in the Shi'i school okay. is that the Quran was compiled in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Islam. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family supervised the compilation of the Holy Quran. Okay. I'm saying it's one of the opinions. Yes, yes, yes. If, if we had longer, we could talk about all the other opinions sure. as to those who say differing opinions. Yeah, this, but let's yeah. say, in the time of the Holy Prophet, he supervises the compilation right. of the Holy the Quran, Quran and supervises the likes of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib yes. who knows the order of the Qur'an, mm -hmm. order of revelation of the Qur'an, the intricacies of the Qur'an. And therefore the Holy Prophet says, I leave behind for you. Right. Now you can't leave something behind if it hasn't been compiled yet. No. Quite true. I leave behind for you the Qur'an and my Ahl al-Bayt. Also when the Prophet asks for a pen and paper. Yes. When he is in his final moments. The calamity of Thursdays. The calamity of Thursdays. And one of the companions who was present said, you are delirious. Yes. The Quran is sufficient for mm. us. Hasbuna kitab Allah. The kitab is, is only... That book, chapters, cover to cover, that's sufficient for us. That is used by a number of Shia scholars to highlight that we believe that the Holy Quran was compiled in the time of the Holy Prophet Peace be upon him and his family. Same. Other schools in Islam say that the Quran was compiled possibly after the right. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family had passed away. Some say in the time of the first Khalifa, others in the time of the second Khalifa, because there was a number of the Huffad of the Quran, those okay. who had memorized the Quran who had passed away, and there was a need to compile the Holy Quran, or that certain people were allocated the task of compiling the Holy Quran. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so now we're just going to go for a break in the next few minutes. But before we do, letter D now. Diacritics, dhamma, kasra, fatah, the little small symbols as it were on each of the letters. If you can highlight that as it were. 
the formation of it. Uh, <laughs> and we could go on and on, as we know. It's a, hopefully a, a pleasing show and an entertaining show for the viewers. The application of the diacritics. Yeah. Dhamma, Kasra, Fatha. Has had a number of stages. Okay. The first stage, one may argue, is a stage which is credited to Abu, Al Abu Aswad al Duali. Abu Aswad al Duali was a person who had learned Arabic grammar from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salam. And at the beginning, these Fatha, Kasra, Dhamma, or we could say in the laws of grammar, Nasb, okay. Jar. Right. Because if something, for example, is Mansub, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. although once one of the scholars was asked, what is the alama of Nasb? And he replied, hatred to Ali ibn Abi Talib. But anyway, Nasb, normally you'll see a Fatha. Okay. Something which is majroor, you might see the kasra. kasra and so let's say with Abu al Aswad al Du'ali, what you have is that say that there was a fatha or there was nasb that had to be there. Right. That would be at the beginning. Because in the time of the Holy Prophet, you don't have kasra, fatha, dhamma, no. tanween, no. and they, these things. They you know, they, they literally knew, they they knew, knew the laws. Recite. Yeah, they knew how to recite. Yes. Yes, it's for and then and then Abu Aswad al Duali is the one who puts the structure at the beginning, right. but that structure is with a dot. Okay. But the dot where it goes gives uh -huh. you an understanding of whether there is nasb or there is jar, for example. Right, right. So if, for example, it went, the dot was at the top, top. of the last letter, uh -huh. Uh -huh. then that is nasb. Yes. If it was at the dot at the bottom, bottom. of the last letter, then what was it? Then it would be jar. Yeah. And if the dot was at the end after, after the, the last letter, yes, yes. then for example, it would be related to a uh, let's right. say, okay? Yeah. So if it's at the uh, bottom, you've got the kasra. At the top, you have the fatha, mm -hmm. and then you've got the dhamma. A hundred years or so later, wow. we developed, so now, we were at the end of the first century. We're moving on to the end of the second century, second century. with Khalil, the son of Ahmed Al-Farahidi. Right. Who helped us move towards the introduction, let's say, Dhamma with a wow. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. getting a bit more used to it. Yes. And uh, rectangles, which may symbolize the other. Okay. Okay. Fatha, oh, Kasra, Kasra, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Or Saad may come in for mm -hmm. Sukun and so on. Yeah, so sure, now sure. you had that introduction. Yes. So we had Abu al Aswad al Duali. We had Khalil, the son of Ahmed right. al Farahidi. Then you had these schools of syntax which emerge. I see. You mentioned earlier in one of your questions about the importance of learning Arabic. Yes. We cannot be a community that stops learning Arabic. Sure. You know, Naho, Sarf, Balagha, we have mm. to introduce these to our children from a young age. Son. There are Inshallah. people who, reality is, the greatest minds in Arabic and some of the greatest scholars of the Quran were non Arabs. Mm -hmm. um, and we're introduced to, for example, the school of Basra with Sibaway. Okay, okay. You're introduced to the school of Kufa with Kasai. Right. You're introduced to the school of Baghdad. So now we have. Three stages with the Fatha and the Kasra and the Dhamma and the Tanween. Mm -hmm. The first stage, of course, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, with his companions. Then after that, Abu al Aswad al Duali, Khalil bin Ahmad al Farahidi, and then the schools that emerge in Basra, Baghdad, yeah, Kufa. Kufa, and the development continues from there. Okay, okay. Just before we go in break, just for the viewers' uh, benefits, what Sayyidina has mentioned is. And again, it's the weakness of English, as it were. It's not just the apostrophes, as it were. It's the way you enunciate the words, the sounds, the symbols, how to pause, when to start and put emphasis on the prefix or suffix and so on and so forth. So these are some of the actual diacritics. Am I right? Or Accent on those coming later. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So with that in mind, we'll join you again in the next few minutes, inshallah.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to our live show tonight. Quarantine to Quran time. Say now, uh, two quick questions that I'd like to put forward, as it were, from viewers. If the Quran, if the Holy Quran, is not just for Arabs, why is there so much importance around Arabia at the moment? What's what's going on? There problems and stuff. What what would you say about that? Well, the importance to Arabia is because of the context of which um, in which the book is revealed. Well, otherwise, it talks about prophets who never came near Arabia as mm. well. You know, there are discussions of prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who never lived in Mecca or in Medina. Uh, so the Quran is not only talking about, you know, Arabia or Arab prophets. Right. And it also talks about journeys of the likes of the Qarnayn and people like sure. this. And that was certainly, um, you know, not necessarily all taking place in Arabia. Yeah, exactly. Let alone the meetings with yeah, George and Met George and so on. Yes. Yeah. Okay, next question... Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum Dr. Sayyid. Um, can I read the Quran in English translation to understand it better? Or is it advisable to read and recite the chapters in Arabic? Thank well, you. Definitely perfect that your Arabic. Okay. Uh, reach a level of eloquence with yes. your Arabic, but simultaneously read the translation of what it is exactly that you're reciting. Okay, a lot yep. of material to get through too. So, letter E now. E for exegesis, as it were, tafsir. Tafsir, according to the great scholar and the martyr, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, may Allah right. bless his soul, is Islam. an act of unveiling okay. Okay. the meanings. Right. Not just the manifest meaning, but to the, unveil the different layers of meaning. The batani meaning. Batan and Zahir is there. Yeah. Zahir should be there and clear, but Batan as well. Um, that will take us towards a world of ta'wil. Mm -hmm. um, and in the world of tafsir, you found that that provides for us more knowledge and understanding of a particular verse of the Holy Quran. Um, the grammar of the verse may be explained. Uh, the reason for the revelation of the verse may be explained. Okay. The okay. lessons may be explained. Right. And you find that this act of tafsir is an act that used to take place from the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, where he was the first to explain the Qur'an. He's teaches them mm -hmm. the, the book. And then after him, of course, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the gate to the city of knowledge. And you had also the likes of Ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who were also um, providing us with a tafsir right. of the Holy Qur'an. Then in Shi'i scholarship, we have many great tafsir. Of them, we have Maj Majma al-Bayan as an example mm -hmm. of um, al-Tabarsi, may Allah bless his soul. You have the tafsir of Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi, the tafsir mm -hmm. of al-Ayashi, the Tibyan of Tusi, so there are a number of great tafasir right. that were written by the early scholars and by the contemporary scholars. And sometimes these tafasir may focus purely on the Arabic grammar. Okay. Others may look at historical analysis. You know, if you look at Ardabili's um, Zubdat al-Bayan, that mm -hmm. is um, a, a legal um, examination um, to look for the legal verses in, okay. the, in the Holy uh, Quran. I think, you know, um, Qutb al-Rawandi, Fiqh al-Quran as well, highlights another text for you when it comes to uh, legal tafasir. So you have different genres of tafasir. You may have mystical tafasir, mm -hmm. philosophical mm -hmm. tafasir, right, right. legal tafasir, sure. historical tafasir. Yes. That generally in the world of exegesis. Uh -huh. And then from there, if you want to go to deeper levels, you'll go to the world of ta'wil. Right, right, yeah. right. Thank you for that. Letter F now, 500 legal verses. And you, sh you said some, like, as it were, on the legat legality, as it were, of verses, you know, um, broken down by one prominent um, tafasir. But what would you say about letter F? It's, it was known in the earliest days of Islam that um, there are 500 legal instruments, verses in the Holy Quran. Okay. Ayat al Ahkam are normally numbered at 500. Okay. The scholars, of course, have differed, uh -huh. but you've stressed on 500 there. Yes. Um, and all religions would have had a certain number of legal verses. You know, you may find that there may have been other religions which have similar number of legal verses. But in the Quran, 500 legal verses 
And in many cases, these verses, you will not find them repeated. Uh, possibly, aqimu salah wa atu zakat in terms of establishing prayer and paying the poor rate, maybe something we hear repeated quite often. Mm, as reminders. But there are many verses um, which provide us with uh, the laws which are not repeated. And you find that they tend to number 500, but you'll find other scholars may differ. Okay, yeah. G now, most commonly known obviously for God. God, <laughs> God, Allah. Sometimes when people, non-Muslims hear Allah, they imagine that that is someone completely different to the God they believe in. Uh, Allah is the name of the Lord. Uh, and of course the Quran focuses on the oneness of God. You know, the major focus, especially speaking to the polytheists of that time, mm -hmm. With central verses of the Holy Quran, one particular surah called monotheism or tawheed. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدٌ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوَنَ أَحَدٌ We know very well that in their trade routes, the Arabs would have met the Christians, they would have met the Jews, and there were Christians and Jews living in Arabia at the time. Yes, There's a big yes. Jewish community in Medina. Sure. Uh, some may for a certain period have had certain polytheistic elements or believing that Jesus is the son of God for example and so the Quran tries to discuss a rejection of Uzair being the son of God according to the Jewish opinion or mm -hmm. that Jesus was the son of God um, according to the Christian opinion for there is a belief that God uh, the oneness of God means that he um, has no partners uh, there is no way that God has a son or a daughter, whatever accusations the Arabs wanted to make about Jesus or they wanted to make about the angels. Mm. There was this pure monotheism that emerges within the Holy Quran, a God who also cannot be seen sure. fundamentally. Yes, yes. Um, in contrast to other beliefs at the time where images of God yep. were very apparent, and the Quran talks of um, Allah and Manat and Uzza mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the idols of Quraysh that were there. Yes. So there is a major focus in the belief in the oneness of God. Okay, yeah. okay. Letter H now, I mean, we refer to H perhaps. And two examples I can give, um, holding on to the rope of Allah, holding um, on the head on the night of Laid al-Qadr. What would you say about that? What's that, sorry? Holding? H, holding the Holy Quran as holding it were. Holding the, the Holy Quran on the? Head. Uh, head on as the head. Um, also yes. holding on to yeah, hold, the rope. Yeah, yeah. Holding, no, holding, on on, rope. holding on to, uh, holding the Quran on well, the head. Yes. Is an act which is mentioned within our main books of hadith. Right. On the, in the last, you'll find, in the nights of Qadr, mm. people will either put the Quran in front of their face or the Quran, they'll place on it head. on the top of their head. Yes. Because we are asking Allah by the right of the Quran on us on this night of forgiveness. Because okay. many of our youth would have grown up and they would have seen, Bika ya Allah. Yes. Bika ya Muhammad, Bika ya Ali, Bika ya Fatima, and so and on. So, on. so, so yes. we used to always ask Allah first by reading that short dua. Mm -hmm. A dua which Al Qutb al Rawandi narrates, Ibn Tawus, Shaykh al Tawusi. And the act of placing the Quran on one's head can be found, for example, Shaykh al Kulaini in a tradition in Al Kafi from Imam al Baqir. He has this tradition which clearly mentions, open the Quran, place it in front of you and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of this Quran on me. Mm -hmm. So this act, my dear brothers and sisters, of placing the Quran in front of us on our heads on the night of Qadr is not an act which is culture. Right. This is religion. Because what else do I want to intercede for me except the thaqalain? Either the Qur'an, I wanted to intercede for me because I've come with so many sins on that day of judgment. I've not come back ma'soom. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to need help on that day. So either the Qur'an is going to intercede for me or I'm going to call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but by mentioning the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sure. and there is no one more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than Muhammad and Al Muhammad salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhima. So holding the Qur'an on the head right. is an act that can be found from the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt But let's not be a community that places the Qur'an on the head mm -hmm. and says, Bihaq al-Qur'an, 
or bihaqqa hadha al-kitab and then we don't open that book until the next shahar Ramadan. Yeah. Let's make this shahar Ramadan which is now only 10, 12 days away. Let's make it a month in which we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Holy Quran. Okay, before I go to letter I, two very quick questions. Salaam, um, can you please recommend an English tafsir, bearing in mind Al-Mizan hasn't been translated in full yet. First question. Second question, because obviously we've got a lot to get through. Assalamu alaikum Sayyid uh, Naqshwani. Jazakullah. Uh, my question is, does the recitation of the Qur'an benefit our deceased? Uh, my father passed away on Hajj and he's buried in Mecca. I will never know what grave is his, as it were. Is there any fadail of being buried there, as it were, i.e. benefits? Can you shed some light? In terms of uh, an English tafsir, tafsir of yeah. the Holy Quran, I would say an enlightening commentary, right. which is available in 20 volumes. It's available online. A team led by uh, the scholar Faqih Imami, that is available um, online, an enlightening commentary. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be one which I would recommend in the English language, certainly. Right. Secondly, of course, recite the Holy Quran is that which has great benefits for our deceased. Okay. Try and recite Surah Yasin. Right. Or if you're by the grave, the brother said, I'm not sure where the grave is. Those mm. who know where the grave is, recite Surah Al-Qadr. Right. But recite Surah Yasin, inshallah, the thawab goes towards your deceased. Okay, with yeah. more questions, we'll go, put, go through them one by one, inshallah, soon. Little I now. Iqra. Iqra. Read. Yes, the first word revealed to the Holy Prophet mm. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and a great choice for the letter I. Iqra. Read in the name of your Lord. Recite in the name of your Lord. That has its own analysis as to the incident, but it highlighted that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, wanted a community that was a literate community. Right. A community that placed a special importance on reading on literacy, right. on writing. If you notice, the first surah to be revealed to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, was Iqra. And that surah ala, which we all have recited, surah 96 of the Holy Quran, first surah to be revealed to the Holy Prophet and straight away there was a command of Iqra. The second surah was which one? Qalam. Qalam, pen. The human being, their worth as a human being yes. is their reading and their writing. Right. Otherwise, the human should be called an orphan. According to who? Imam al Sadiq. Imam al Sadiq said, An orphan is not one without a father or a mother. An orphan is one without literature. We don't want to become the community of La Naqra. We don't read. We want to be the community of Iqra. <sighs> When you said letter I, Iqra, it's because the Qur'an straight away wanted that community of reading and writing. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, wanted to build a community like that. That even if prisoners were caught from the battlefield, mm -hmm. teach our people how to read and write and will release you. It was as simple as that. The last thing the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family wanted was a, was a community which had neglected reading and writing. And I love it sometimes when we go to recite in certain mosques, when I've lectured in certain mosques in the world, and there's a couple that deserve a mention. Mm -hmm. Of them, for example, at the Haidari Islamic Center in South London, two people deserve a mention. Hajj Amir Laka and Hajj Murtada Huda, who both recognize the importance of a community that loved literature. Hajj Amir was the one who was so adamant on the Haidari Islamic Center having a library at the front of the center. And Hajj Murtadha Huda was adamant on having books for mm -hmm. sale as soon as you walked into the Haidari Islamic yes, Center on the right. Yes, yes. Those two deserve a special mention. A second place that deserves a special mention for their love of Iqra and their love of the Qalam is the Saba Center in San Jose okay. on the Bay Area. Right. They, under the guidance of Mawlana Abidi, have done excellent work and I remember vividly that there was books which were available for a person to buy as well as other artifacts in the center. 
So they highlighted that a community center, a mosque, should always have a bookshop or a library. Right. The bookshop so that our youth on the way out are able to buy the books. So that just in case they are on their way out and they remember a topic they need a book on. Mm -hmm. Likewise, Hujjat Stanmu deserves yes. a mention. For they have the port cabin outside where you have the books which are available for us. The books available for us on sale. Yes. As well as the library that's available there from which I benefited. Right. Al Haj Murtaba Bandali, Alif International. Yes. And the amount of work that he has done to ensure that publications, book titles are available for people to be able to learn yeah. about the Ahl Bayt. And I personally remember reading my first books at Alif International okay. all those years back. And truly, we have to be a community that recognizes the value of Iqra. Right. No okay, we're going to go for a short break uh, in the next two, three minutes, uh, say now. Letter J for justice, though, first, before we go for Justice, break. fundamental in the mm. Quran. Adala. Fundamental. Now, you said Adala, we mm. could also say Qist. Qist, as you mentioned initially. That's the beauty. In the Quran, there is this focus on justice. God is just. And the establishment of justice on the earth, even if it means that you establish justice by having to witness over yourself yeah, or your family, family members. members. Yes, that's how the Quran mentions. They say that at the Harvard Law School, Surah 4, verse 135. Ya amanu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers, no, mankind. He wants all of us to be the ones who establish justice. Not just the believer, the nas, all of you. Establish justice. Be a witness to God. Because true justice is when a person is ready to recognize that the main witness on their life is not the CCTV nor the speed camera. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can dodge the CCTV. And I can make sure that the speed camera doesn't catch me. But when I recognize Allah is the witness, then there's no way that I'll be acting unjustly or unjustly while the Lord is watching me. Yes. And that's why in the Quran and in Islamic ethics, the greatest ethical attribute is justice. Why? Because every other attribute can have a negative to it. Right. Generosity could be over generous. True. Knowledge can lead you to arrogance. Justice, wherever it's done, is perfect. So J for justice, the Quran stresses on justice throughout. And Allah orders you to establish justice and goodness. SubhanAllah. With that in mind, uh, we're going for a short break. Viewers, just join us again in the next couple of minutes, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the live show tonight. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Kayfo Qarun, as it were. Um, if you could share. Qarun was the cousin of Nabi Musa alayhi salam and, okay. um, and was also very jealous of Musa's success. So if you look within the Holy Quran, he's mentioned alongside Fir'aun and Haman. Mm -hmm. So in the Quran in Surah 28, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the triumvirate of Qarun, Fir'aun and Haman. Haman. And that triumvirate that is mentioned are the ones who show animosity and hate to Musa. Now, having animosity and hate from people outside of the family, you can understand. You know, uh, Let's say Pharaoh has a particular hate for Moses with the message that he has. Haman is his advisor. But Qarun, you wouldn't expect from your own family to have a backstabber. And this Qarun was extremely wealthy. And a real lesson with those who sometimes think that they have everything, that in a moment, 
they could be swallowed literally by a virus. And before you know it, they're gone. And this person, what he had done, he had tried to attack the reputation of Nabi Musa alayhi salam when Nabi Musa was giving a lecture one day. And when Nabi Musa alayhi salam was giving that lecture, mm -hmm. you found that he asked the lady to go and slander Nabi Musa in the middle of the lecture by sh shouting out that Moses has committed zina with me. And you found that, uh, of course, Nabi Musa didn't lose his cool. He knows that this is slander. He knows he hasn't done such a thing. And Nabi Musa just looked at her and said, who told you to say that? <laughs> she said, Qarun. The earth swallowed Qarun. Uh -huh. So Qarun is given as an example to those who had everything wealth-wise, but they lacked taqwa, they lacked iman, the earth swallowed them. And that money was of no avail to them. Okay, uh, moving on swiftly now. L for light. Light, with probably the most stunning ayah in the Holy mm. Quran. You know, Salud. Allah nur samawat wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. What do we mean when we say Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth? What we mean by that is something which scholars of tafsir have given monograph after monograph and classical works and analysis of Allah being the light of the heavens and the earth. Yeah. Now, in one moment you stop there and you think, okay, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Yeah. But then he gives you this parable. A parable which involves a lamp sure. and an olive tree, so an neither east mm. nor west, which continues to light up. And what is this parable that's being given? So if you ever want to see a wonderful verse in the Holy Quran, Surah 24, verse 35, mm. the verse of light. light. It's a stunning ayah yes. and you should just try and see how many scholars have tried to give an interpretation of that particular Eye of the Holy Quran. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is light, pure light. How that light emanates. How it radiates. Subhanallah. It's a phenomenal verse. Subhanallah. Okay, moving on now quickly for letters M. Muhkam and Mutashabbih. Muhkam and Mutashabbih. Surah 3 verse 7 of the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides verses into two. Right. Some verses are clear in the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. Some are ambiguous. Okay. Okay. And without a doubt, the ones who will make clear for us which verses are clear, clear. and which are and how the ambiguous relate to the clear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are those who Allah has endowed with knowledge. knowledge. And they are Muhammad and Al Muhammad, salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. The muhkam verses therefore are clear. The mutashabih verses are what? Mutashabih verses are ambiguous. ambiguous. Right. Sometimes, of course, you may find classical examples given as to how to make this easier to understand. Right. For example, in the Quran, I may read an ayah that says, for example, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that yad Allah fawqa aidihim. Allah's hand is above their yeah, right. hand. Seemingly ambiguous, one may argue mm -hmm. in this trivial mm -hmm. example, sure. that what does it mean that Allah's hand is above their hand? Does it mean Allah has a hand? Okay, no. And then you have a doubt. Maybe Allah has hands. And some said, well, yes, maybe he does. And this verse is literal, that Allah has hands. And there are certain actual theological schools that believe in anthropomorphism and that Allah on the Day of Judgment, we will see him and he has hands. Yeah. And there are some of them who even said that, well, his hands might be bigger than our hands. And all of a sudden now, there are question marks that when Allah says, Yad Allah fawqa aidihim, Allah's hand is above their hand. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. But then we look at a clear verse in the Quran which says, Laysa ka mithlihi shay. Mm, there is none nothing. like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might find a verse in the Quran where a person sees it and says, That on that day the faces will be looking towards their Lord. Looking towards our Lord. That means we're going to see Allah. That means Allah may be sitting on a kursi, yeah, a on a throne, and we may see Allah. Allah. But then we see a clear verse in the Quran when Moses asks that the children of Israel want to see you. Allah says, Len tarani. Len Lita'bid means forever, nobody will ever be able to see me, whether it's in dunya or in oh. akhirah. 
So in the Quran, there are ayahs which Allah divides them into two. Right. The clear and the ambiguous. I can easily turn around and say, well, how will I know what's clear, what's ambiguous? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left for me the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt to explain these things to me. Okay, um, naturally moving on after letter M. N for Nasikh and Mansukh as it were. Nasikh and Mansukh. Nasikh and Mansukh is about a verse that abrogates. Nasikh is a form okay. of abrogation. abrogation. Right, okay. A verse that abrogates a temporary ruling which may have been there for a certain period of time but now has been abrogated with a new verse being introduced. Mm -hmm. Which shows that the Quran is growing, evolving with the community it's as dynamic. they are evolving. It's dynamic. Dynamic. It's dynamic. You find, for example, scholars differ about how many abrogations took place. Mm -hmm. How many abrogations took place. took place? For example, let's say one abrogation, according to some scholars, was that the idda. Okay. For a widow mm -hmm. was one year. Right. The waiting period. Yes, yes. For a widow was one year. One year. How long currently in Islamic law is the idda for a widow currently? Mm -hmm. Four months Four and months. Ten, ten days. days. Yeah. If the idda origin was one year and in Islamic law it's four months and ten days. So what's happened? Exactly. Here is an example of Chim abrogation. Yes. Nasikh, mansukh. Okay, okay. Some scholars say there were 20 moments of abrogation that have occurred. Others say, no, there was only once. Only once was there a ruling mm -hmm. that was temporary and then removed. When? Paying sadaqa to see the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu wa dhana adaytum al-Rasoolah. Faqaddimu bayna yaday najwaakum sadaqa. Oh, you who believe. Ida najaytum al-Rasoolah. If you're going to go and have counsel with the Prophet, mm -hmm. Ayatul Najwa, this one. Right. Pay Sadaqa. Ya ayu al ladhina amanu idha najaytum al rasoola faqaddimu bayna yaday najwaakum Sadaqa. Companions used to all go and sit with him. Yes. Arabs, if you tell them don't pay, they'll run. <laughs> if you tell them pay, they'll run. You tell them don't pay, they'll stay. Okay. People's love for ilm sometimes depends on whether you put a price to the conference or no. If you put a price to the conference that there's 20 pounds per ticket, no. no. You make it free, the whole, of you course. put food, the whole of dunya comes. Next so time. now, yes. with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, these guys would come and they'd sit with him. Now Prophet wants his private time, mm -hmm. others are coming in, true, there's true, other true, guests true. coming in. Some of these guys will not move. Quran said, oh you who believe, you're gonna come and seek counsel of the Prophet, pay, sadaqa. The moment that was revealed, nobody came, except one man, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib yes. Because for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, paying that amount to sit with Rasulullah, what is it? What is it? Blessing. What is it? It's a, it's a blessing. I ask any Muslim out there who's living today, has not met Rasulullah. I ask him, I ask her, how much would you pay to sit with the Holy Prophet, mm. peace be upon his family? Ayah Surah 58 verse 11 if I'm not mistaken. Surah 58, 11. No. Only one man. The moment he paid that sadaqah, it was abrogated. Never again. As a sign, there's a clear difference between the son of Abu Talib and the rest of you. <laughs> there is no coincidence. Yeah. I am the city of knowledge in Ali's It's no coincidence. Sure. Who paid that sadaqah in ayat al najwa except the son of Abu Talib? Nobody. Amazing. Thank you, thank you. In the first half of our show, we mentioned letter C for compilation. Bridging that now, letter O, order. 
The order of the Quran. The Quran is not revealed. The Quran is not structured in order of revelation. revelation. Otherwise, the first surah should be Iqra. Uh, but what is the surah? Surah Alaq should be number one. But what's the first surah? Surah Fatiha. Surah Hamd. But Surah Al Fatiha was the fifth surah mm. to be revealed. The only man who compiled it in order of revelation was Imam Ali alayhi salam. In what we have known as the Mus'haf of Ali. Okay. But that is with the Imam. Mom. Otherwise, the Quran as we have it is not in order, order of revelation. revelation. No. And this was a structure ordered by the heavens. Okay. Yeah. P for parts, as it were. Um. Parts split mm -hmm. into 30 parts. parts. Yes. Which came a lot later, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and you know, these uh, we spoke about the orders earlier. Mm. Yeah, split into 30 parts. And you'll find that um, the 30th, which is known in many circles as Juzu Amma, mm -hmm. because it begins with Amma Yatasa'alun, Surah Al Naba. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's split into 30 parts. And even the idea of Ajza is even mentioned in some of the traditions of Ahlul Bayt. Okay, Q now for Qadar. So, yeah, Laylatul Qadr, the grand night, 23rd, according to some. Mm -hmm. Others practice the odd nights. Yes, yes. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr. That the Quran was revealed on the night of Qadr. Some say, well, if it was revealed on the night of Qadr, and the Prophet's Ba'tha begun on the 27th of Rajab, Mm -hmm. And the night of Qadr is in Shahar Ramadan. Is there a contradiction? Because if the Prophet's prophethood began on the 27th of Rajab and he was told, Iqra, but the Quran says, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. So, what's the, what's the contradiction? Yes. Scholars have given different opinions. Okay, okay. Different opinions. From A, a question as to whether the 27th is the day Iqra was revealed. B, that 27th was the beginning of the gradual revelation, whereas Qadr is when the whole Qur'an is placed in the heart, heart of the Holy Prophet. Yes, there are yes. discussions on this between the scholars. Right, yeah. uh, moving on quickly now, letter R, reminder and also reflection. No doubt in the Qur'an, <laughs> one of its names is Dhikr. dhikr. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr. Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we are the ones who have revealed the reminder. And truly those who get closer to the Quran, it becomes a reminder for them. That when I'm about to perform an act, automatically the Quran acts as a reminder for me before I perform a certain act. Mm -hmm. Should I? Shouldn't I? When? How to? How? So when Allah describes it as a dhikr, it's a reminder to me and to you and to all the creation. Reflection is represented, no doubt, many times in the Quran. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder over the Quran? Or are their hearts locked? Are their mm. hearts sealed? And that shows us that what opens our hearts. Right, right. Because our hearts can have diseases. Yes, naturally. Yep. can have a marad. فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَض Right. I want to go from the world of a heart which has a marath to a world of a heart which is Salim. Mm. What did Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam pray for? Qalb, Salim. Yawm la yanfa'u. Maalu wa la banun illa man ata Allah bi qalbin. Salim. So I want a qalb that's Salim. Mm -hmm. Not a qalb that has fi qulubihim marath. Yes. Fazadahum Allah marath. Not a heart that has marath. Yes. I want a heart that has sin, yes. peace. Yes, yes. And so what better than tadabbur on the Qur'an? So the Qur'an is a reminder and the Qur'an has to be reflected Perfect. upon. Subhanallah, subhanallah, thank you. Um, S for satanic verses now. The satanic verses. <laughs> Salman Rushdie had written a book in the 80s called the satanic verses. verses. And with that book was a reference to whether the Prophet, a question which arose, whether the Prophet was affected by shaitan in the revelation of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. There are some schools in Islam that narrate, astaghfirullah wa billah, that our holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, was affected by shaitan 
made a mistake in the revelation by listening to shaitan and not listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If my prophet can be affected by shaitan, then how do I know he's not being affected by shaitan at other moments? Mm. That's why for us, infallibility is fundamental. Salman Rushdie wrote the satanic verses, yes. not on the basis of his own imagination no. only, but because there are hadiths Hadith. yes. in Muslim literature. Sure. Yes. Well, then again, we let every Tom, Dick and Harry narrate right. hadith. Yeah, of course. The one who met the Prophet for a couple of years, the one who was a rabbi or a priest, <laughs> the one who fought Amir al-Mu'mineen at battle after battle, all of them began to tell us about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The son of a cannibal told us about the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. The ones who fought his family told us about the Holy Prophet, his family. I'm not surprised they'll say shaitan affected him. How did he affect him? He affected him that he's sitting amongst the Quraysh and while he's sitting amongst them trying to bring them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he suddenly talks about the idols of the Quraysh. Mm -hmm. Lat, Manad and Uzza are mentioned in Surah Al-Najm. Yes? Yes. But then supposedly shaitan affected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi astaghfirullah. Shaitan himself in the Quran says, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمِ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Yes. How could shaitan affect when shaitan himself admits in the Quran mm -hmm. in Surah 32 verse 82 to 83 sure. that yes. by your majesty, by your glory, I'll affect, Lead deceive all of them except, except those who are purified. Yeah. And yet they say, that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was trying to preach towards the Quraysh, shaitan affected him. That when he heard Allah manat and uzza, he said, Tilka al-gharani qal ula, wa inna shafa'atuhunna laturtaja. That these are the highest of the lords and it's their intercession that I seek. Hmm. People said Salman Rushdie, Salman Rushdie is the one who has written the satanic verse. Okay, you making fun of the prophet of a religion is something which is without a doubt disrespectful. Yeah. But what happens if the Muslims themselves are saying this about my yes. prophet? I've never narrated it. Yeah. Our own books of hadith <laughs> in some Muslim schools. Disgusting. Shahab Ahmed wrote on the satanic verses. You can read it online using sources from other schools in Islam. Rasulullah, they say, was affected by Shaitan astaghfirullah. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know. There are, there are certain people, if you say a single thing about them, they'll call you sectarian. Yeah. But saying Rasulullah is affected by Shaitan, there's no issue. So those were the satanic, satanic verses. verses. Yeah. Okay. Um, T for Tahrif. And there's, there's a question to come after that. But T for Tahrif, if you can shed light on that. Yeah, Tahrif is this belief. That has been there amongst certain Muslims. Okay. That an alteration occurred with the Holy Quran in terms of, uh, for example, omission. Right. And so, Ayatollah al khui may Allah bless his soul, has Shalom. a discussion on this. And in his discussion on this, he says there are different types of tahrif. There are tahrif where they say that there may be a verse missing, like some who don't believe Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of a surah. Mm. So they'll straight away say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Some might whisper it, but some don't believe Bismillah is part yes, of a... Yes, yes, yes. Some believe that there may be verses missing. If you read a book, I recommend to all of our viewers. The reason I'm saying is because the people who are normally labeled with tahrif, mm -hmm. that we believe in a different Quran. <laughs> Apparently there's a surah called Wilayat, which yeah, we believe yes, in. Yes. I wish there was a surah which made things a bit clearer Please, to sir. some people, but even I guarantee you, if there was that surah, still there'll still be people like from Jamal and Safin's children yeah, alive. Sure, sure. Anyway, so what you have is that people will say Shia. Okay, go to this book. Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti has a book called Al-Itqan. Okay. All the viewers, I would be delighted if you are able to read this book. If you can just spell it out for everyone. Well, uh, in English, English. I-T-Q-A-N. Right. Itqan of Suyuti shows all the different traditions where non-Shia have said the Quran is missing verses. Goat at some, I don't know, goats were clearly hungry at the time. And yeah, you know, other, yeah. others who say that this verse was there and that verse on stoning and this verse on suckling and God knows what else. And 
Mu'inta, if you're going to keep throwing this Shia, I have different Qur'an, Shia, I have different Qur'an, I'm not going to deny that Muhaddith Nuri in Fasl al-Khitab may have said certain things. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that there were scholars of the period of the Safawid Empire who have their questions about the Qur'an, about the compilation of the Qur'an, about the recital of the Qur'an. I'm not going to deny but you tell me that when you're coming to the majority of Shia scholarship from the beginning, from Imam al-Sadiq until today, you'll see our scholars tell us to abide by the laws of the Qur'an. Tell us about the rewards for reciting this whole surah of the Qur'an. If these surahs are missing verses and so on, how do these things then fit in? Mm -hmm. I may be following a law, there was a verse, but I don't know where that verse is. So why am I following a law? We spoke about Nasakh and Mansukh earlier. Suyuti shows the number of Muslims who are not even Shia or belong to the Shia who believe that there are verses of the Quran which, were miss which are missing, surahs which were longer. I will leave it with Ayatollah al-Khu'i. This could be a very long discussion. I'll leave it with Ayatollah al-Khu'i to say. For us, we believe tahrif, alteration, happened in the tafsir of the Holy in Quran. Tafsir. Let's go there. You know, I don't want to open the can of worms here. Because we're going through A to Z and we're only a few yes. letters away from finishing and I know sure. we're coming towards the end of the program. Ayatollah Khoi said, yes, in the tafsir of the Qur'an, there was tahrif. There okay. were people who manipulated and altered the tafsir. Yeah. Okay, in yeah. relation to that, Sayyidina. Um, Salaamu Alaikum, there's a question here. Uh, dear Sayyidina, um, there are hadith, as it were, in Al-Kafi, where the Holy Sixth Imam, alayhi salam, Imam Jafar Sadiq, alayhi salam, recites certain verses with different words such as Ummah as Aimah. What is the meaning behind these hadith? If an ayah of the Quran says, Kuntum khaira ummatin, and in brackets next to it, it's written Aimma. Okay. Tafsir of Ummah, Tafsir. Mm -hmm. You can write on the margin or next to the word, you can write that this word, the tafsir of it, is that the best people. People. You were the best leaders which came to mankind who enjoined the good. And forbid the evil. Mm, Even if someone tells me that there's 17,000 eyes in the Quran, and we know there's 6,500, but if yes. someone says there's a hadith that says 17, yes, well, if you add the tafsir of the Holy Quran, okay. with the Quran, it'll come to 17,000. 17, Further than that, even if you show me something in Al-Kafi, show me who the narrator is, is everybody who is within Al-Kafi to be taken as reliable and as trustworthy in their narration, there might be someone there in Al-Kafi who some scholars have looked at and said, this person is not someone we take narrations mm -hmm. from. Okay, now going to the last six letters, as it were. Um, U for Uthmani Kodis. Yeah, it seems Kodis. that, um, you know, in and around... Um, in and around the period of uh, Uthman's Caliphate, mm -hmm. um, I would say in the late 20s after Hijra, Obviously, you've got uh, the Qur'an has spread far and wide now. and There are Muslims who are reciting different recitals and so on. And they wanted to come to one uniform codice, right. which everyone follows. Okay. And that uniform codice is the one that we have with us until today. Okay. Different chains of transmission, Asim and Hafs are prominent in the transmission and the uh -huh. most famous one that reaches us until today. And they have their relationship with the companions and with the Imams alayhi salam. Okay, V now for violence. Yeah, sometimes people say that the Quran is a book of violence, it encourages mm -hmm. violence. I'm not going to deny that there are verses in the Holy Quran which, if a person takes them out of context, are harsh. They're quite harsh, even violent. You know, when the, when the sacred months have passed, kill the disbelievers mm. wherever you see them. Yes. And, and if someone who says Islam's original peace, and you've got Surah 9 verse 5 saying, kill the disbelievers wherever yeah. you see them. It's going to run. Someone's going to therefore say that the Quran is violent. And why are we surprised then when ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other groups emerge when their holy book says, kill the disbelievers wherever you see them. First and foremost, I don't think, I don't think it's just the Qur'an that as a religious text may have certain lines or verses. If we take them out of context, yeah. they seem quite violent. The Bible has a few, uh, you know, the Torah and there's other texts as well. Secondly, there may be people who are not people of faith, but may adopt a worldview of violence. People who led countries and ended up destroying and killing people who never had faith. Thirdly, these verses do not appear in a vacuum. There's a context. The context as well should not be taken without looking at the verse before it and the, and verse, the verse after, after it. 
when these Arabs had made a treaty with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, that they will look after the rights of the Muslims living in Mecca, and there would be 10 years of peace between the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, yes. and the Arabs, one night they ambushed a group of the Muslims and beheaded the whole tribe. When they, when they did this, the narrations very clearly mention to us that if you look at verse number four, verse number four says, those who made the peace treaty with you but have not broken it, don't punish them. Right. Verse number six says, and those of the ones who have done this but have come to you seeking to talk to you, right. talk to them, okay. so that they yeah. may listen to the words of Allah. Yes, yes. Verse number five said that there's a number of months that have to pass. If these people still are adamant that what they've done by beheading a group of people is correct, mm -hmm. then you are to go and kill them. Okay. I think there were countries before Islam, yes. after Islam, who would believe that if you go and ambush a whole area and you kill a group of people, then even the chair or execution was to be there for you. So a person who wants to turn around and say, well, therefore, this is preaching violence, not at all. Because if you put it alongside and do tafsir of the Quran by the Quran, then no doubt there are verses when you do tafsir of the Quran by the Quran, which highlight, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ For example, لَا عَبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبِدُونَ مَا عَبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَبِدُونَ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبِدُونَ مَا عَبُدُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلْيَدِينَ You have your religion, I have mine. لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدِّينَ There is no compulsion in religion. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to believe, let them believe. Whoever wants to disbelieve, let them disbelieve. There's a balance. Okay, alhamdulillah, thank you. W for women. A whole chapter of the Holy Quran and probably Islam is the religion which is seen as the one that is the worst towards women yeah. in the community, um, towards the female, um, and yet there is a whole chapter called Nisa. Nisa. Do I deny that Muslims have had atrocious periods of behavior with the females in their community? No, I cannot deny. Mm -hmm. Muslims have been at times male chauvinists, they've been misogynistic, just like non-Muslims have been in their history as well. We know the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, came into a context that needed reform, and a reform that was not or is not to be expected to happen overnight. Um, some people were like, well, why hasn't this all happened? Listen, there are some countries that took <laughs> a thousand years after Islam for them to give a, wo a woman the rights to own property. There are some countries that took a thousand years where it gave their woman the right to have education. Yes. There are some countries that took a thousand years for them to give their woman the right to be able to vote. Mm -hmm. So to say that the Quran is a book which is, you know, which is uh, which gives no rights to women and so on. A whole chapter was named after, after. a woman, Maryam, yeah. the mother of Christ. Yes. A whole chapter was called Nisa That's about so women. women, but. We also have to realize that in the history of humanity, not just in the history of Islam, there have been people who've taken verses out of context, there have been people who have abused verses and hadiths to suit their own worldview, and inshallah things will change. Okay, X for xenophobia. Yes, the Quran definitely wanted to speak out against all forms of xenophobia mm -hmm. and racism. Racism might be more focused on the physical outlook of a person, where xenophobia is this as if worldview of clash of civilizations, we're a greater race than the rest of you, we're more noble than the rest of you. Why are you people even mixing with us? You're lower, you're inferior, you're, we're Aryan, you're not, we're of pure birth, you're not. Islam did not want that to be the atmosphere in society. Right. Um, and so a lovely message, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha nas inna khalaqnakum. من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارف وإن أكرمكم عند الله يرقاكم O mankind, mm -hmm. we created you from male and female, female. different races, so that you different tribes, tribes, so that you recognize each other, yes. get to know each other, mm -hmm. recognize, engage in dialogue. Sure. Isn't it a shame now we're yeah. talking of eugenics? Now we're talking that they actually want to breed a master race and they want to kill off the black community and the Indian community, the Africans with vaccines and they want to destroy people. This is what's being talked about currently. That you know what, there are certain races, so be it, they die. Even the elderly who are bedrock of our society, now it's a case of, well, if the elderly have to die, so be it. You know, they're, not, they're of no use. That type of attitude is not the attitude. The Quran did not want us to have an attitude looking down at people. You're inferior to me. Your colors inferior to mm -hmm. me. You shouldn't be mixing in my society. That xenophobia, no way was what was within the Holy Quran. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, why now? Uh, penultimate letter. Why for Yasin? Yasin. Surah Yasin, the heart of the Quran. Quran. There's no way that we could uh, do an A to Z 
of something without so, mentioning the heart, yes. and it is the heart of the Quran. The rewards, the benefits, the lessons from that surah mm -hmm. are immense. Um, and definitely one which we are honored that we learn to recite from a young age. Hopefully to keep our heart beating by reciting the heart of the Quran. Okay, finally. Uh, Zed. What would Zed you have chosen for Zed? Zakat. 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 Purification. Mm. And one of the ways in which you purify, purify your soul according to the Quran is by giving away a certain amount of charity. And, you know, people don't like to give, they like to take. So one way you purify yourself is by giving away from oneself. Okay. There are different forms of zakat. There is zakat, which is wajib. Uh -huh. And there is zakat, which is mustahab. Uh -huh. So the zakat at the end of the holy month of Ramadan, zakat al-fitr is wajib. A zakat 2.5% is wajib on certain items. Um, and then you have zakat, which is mustahab, a form of sadaqah maybe, which is mustahab, which you want to give to anybody. Mm -hmm. But also other forms of zakat are, for example, saying something nice to someone. Yes. That purifies you and sure. society. Smiling. Smiling. That no doubt purifies you and society. Uh, so all the central basis of zakat was to purify oneself, in turn purifying society, and hence... There was a major aim to be able to purify those who lived around the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And that's our A to Z guide to the Holy Quran. Okay, okay. So now we've run out of time, and viewers, I do like to apologize on behalf of Imam Hussein TV for the technical issues that we've been encountering this um, episode, as it were, or t on tonight's live show. So in, uh, just one last point, there's a quick question from uh, Vidda and she just wanted to know that um, what would you recommend in terms of a tafsir in English? Is there one available of Imam Hassan Askari al-Islam in English if possible? Yeah, Your tafsir al-Askari, mm -hmm. tafsir of Imam al-Askari al-Islam is not complete. Yeah. Um, but we do have the first few chapters. Um, and it's attributed to Imam al-Askari alayhi salam that's available and it's translated online. Okay. I mentioned earlier an enlightening commentary which is the full tafsir sure. of 20 volumes, alislam.org has it. Okay, so we've now come to the end of our program tonight, which was on quarantine to Quran time. Um, I'm deeply indebted to Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani for his presence tonight and you know, really going in depth actually from letter A to Z. From Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani and myself, Muhammad Ali. See you again next time, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum.